just fix this. That's better. Okay, music. Do the thing again. Hello there, this is Simma Dave, stage name The Canned Historian, ready to lay down the funk with a little history. Lay down the funk is still what the kids say, right? Those who read my histories pretty regularly know that I like to write about things that are great. And really, who can blame me? Great is what makes the world go round, not love or the individual angular momentum contributions of accelerated objects. Here, I'll be talking about one of the oldest greats that I know, Ramses the Great. Considered the greatest pharaoh of Egypt, as well as the greatest cat lover in a place full of cat lovers, Ramses took his kingdom to the extent of its greatness. He conquered lands to the north and the south, restored the balance of the Egyptian religion, increased the living standards of the people, and, most importantly, built a bunch of statues of himself to remind people about how great he was. Hey, I never said modesty was a prerequisite to greatness. Ramses was born into the ruling 19th dynasty of the New Kingdom, which was much shinier and less crotchety than the Old Kingdom. Baby Ramses, who, yes, has a statue too, was born around 1300 BC. BC, of course, meaning before crawlers, since our calendar is obviously based on the invention of those delicious circular pastries. His father, Seti, was already the pharaoh and needed a son to succeed him, because his daughter wouldn't be able to do it. That'd just be silly. As such, Seti brought young Ramses along on his military campaigns to learn the ways of a leader, believing that even the Boy Scouts wasn't manly enough. He was thus made a general in the army at the age of 10, and possibly even made co-pharaoh with his father before his voice even cracked. Ramses took over upon Seti's death in 1279 BC, ready and eager to take the pharaoh mobile out for a spin on his own. His first priority was to solve the religious issues that had been plaguing Egypt since the previous dynasty. Six decades earlier, the pharaoh Akhenaten decided to simplify the number of Egyptian gods from the plethora of choices like Ra, Osiris, Sekhmet, and Nun, the helpful god who will help carry your canoe to the river, to a single god, the sun deity of the Aten. While the people might have been happy they had less gods to remember, this was one of those things they went along with mostly because they didn't want to hurt Akhenaten's feelings, or get thrown into the Nile with all those crocs swimming about. But after the embalming fluid dried within he and his son, the famous only after it was dead King Tut, the Egyptians quickly turned their back on the Aten and went back to all the memorizing. Ramses helped complete this process, restoring the temples, festivals, and the names of highways back to the old gods. Religion is nice and all, but it is on the battlefield and not in the temple, that legends are born. Take that link in your stupid water temple. Ramses certainly demonstrated his prowess in battle, and by that I mean he ordered his loyal subjects to demonstrate their prowess in battle. Same thing, really. His first victory came at the expense of Mediterranean pirates, who had been annoying the Egyptians by attacking trade vessels, raiding coastal towns, and forcing people to go see their movie sequels that aren't bad, but just aren't as good as the original. In 1278 BC, Ramses caught the pirates by surprise near the Nile Delta and captured the bulk of their ships in a single naval battle. That convinced them to lay off the Egyptians for a while and bother other civilizations in the region about why the rum is gone. Ramses also led an invasion of Nubia to the south, personally charging headlong into battle on his chariot that he just got in short. This allowed Egypt to expand further south, but not south enough to touch the scary parts of Africa. No thank you. But Ramses' biggest fight came in what we like to call the Middle East. The Egyptians were a little touchy ever since a group from that area called the Hyksos took over Egypt 400 years prior, and they were holding that grudge longer than your mother from that time you went to your in-laws for Thanksgiving. Previous pharaohs made attempts to bring the region under their control, but none of them were named Ramses the Great of the 19th Dynasty. That would be quite the coincidence if they were. In 1274 BC, Egypt invaded Syria, then ruled by the Hittite Empire, voted the ancient civilization most likely named by a drooling two-year-old. The two armies met at the Battle of Kadesh, one of the first engagements in history that people decided to actually write down the specific details. Thanks, note-taking nerds! The Hittites gave the Egyptians a run for their money to start the battle, but Ramses recovered like a guy who almost falls after tripping on a sidewalk and forced a Hittite retreat. While victorious, Ramses didn't have the men or supplies or libations to just hang around, and were forced to hightail it back to Egypt. 
A back and forth emerged between the Egyptians and the Hittites until they got sick of all the fighting. Thus, the two powers signed the world's oldest surviving peace treaty in 1258 BC, if something that's the equivalent of a crumpled up piece of paper counts as surviving. Two copies of the treaty exist, one for the Hittites that said the Egyptians were the ones crying for peace, and another in Egyptian hieroglyphs that say the opposite. High school never ends. Nonetheless, the terms of the treaty lasted throughout Ramses' rule, and Ramses even took a Hittite princess as one of his approximately 200 wives, which is something that sounds cool until you want to watch the football game on Sunday afternoon. Ramses has been popularly depicted as the Egyptian pharaoh to whom Moses made the demand, Let my people go. Despite portrayals by Yul Brenner in the classic film, Joel Edgerton in the current version, and an animated performance by Ray Fiennes, aka Voldemort, historians and religious scholars date the exodus prior to Ramses' rule in the 13th century BC, meaning some other pharaoh had the displeasure of being rained on by frogs. But Ramses' biggest contribution, as far as us non-before Crullers people are concerned, are the massive structural works that were built in his honor. By this point, the pyramids were old news, they being constructed over a millennium beforehand, and Ramses was looking to one of those stupid triangles. He designed many temples to the gods, which just so happened to include a statue or two of himself, because that's not sacrilegious. One of his most famous works were the Abu Simbel temples, a commemoration to the Battle of Kadesh that was literally carved out of a mountainside. The site was so grand that not one, not two, but four identical statues of Ramses had to be created to guard it. Ramses didn't even mind having his head on a sphinx's body, as long as he didn't need to cough up the hairballs. He also got to work on a memorial to himself long before he was dead, later to be known as the Ramseum. And if that's not enough narcissism to handle, he also built a new capital called Pi Ramses, meaning the Domain of Ramses. Built closer to his possessions in the Middle East, it became one of the largest cities of the world at this time, and possessed a palace, an open market, and a huge stable for horses, watched over by Ramses himself, of course. Ramses the Great ruled Egypt for over 60 years, possibly the longest among any pharaoh in history. Of course, for the Egyptians, life is only the first part of life. That sounded cooler in the script. Upon his death in 1213 BC, his body was given the mummy treatment, wherein his brain was removed by way of an iron hook up his nose, his vital organs pulled out through a slit in his side, his empty cavity flushed out with wine and spices, and then dehydrated by placing it in salt for 70 days, and finally the corpse would be wrapped in linen bandages for long-term preservation. Still sounds more preferable than a colonoscopy. Mummies were made because the deceased would need their bodies for the afterlife, especially pharaohs who would then join the Egyptian pantheon as gods, meaning after he died he still ruled over you. Jeez, give me my space, Ramses. Ramses' mummy was initially placed in the Valley of the Kings. Unfortunately, tomb robbing was just as big of a problem during ancient Egypt as in more modern times. Just ask A. So around 969 BC, Ramses was secretly moved to another tomb that held eight other pharaohs, which got annoying when Tutmos III hogged the bathroom every morning. His tomb was eventually discovered in 1881, and Ramses has been on display in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo ever since, coming back to life at night thanks to the tablet of Akhmen Ra, of course. Analysis of his mummy revealed that in his old age, he suffered from arthritis, poor circulation, a hunched back, and heavily infected teeth proving that no matter how accomplished you are in life, the forces of nature will get you in the end. In a less depressing note, microscopic inspection of his roots showed that Ramses actually had red hair, officially joining the ranks of fellow gingers Eric the Red, Queen Elizabeth I, and Thomas Jefferson to counterbalance the stupidity of Carrot Top. Oftentimes I question whenever someone or something is labeled the Great, but the cognomen is definitely deserved in the case of Ramses the Great. His reign brought about a long period of peace and prosperity within Egypt, as well as war and famine among his enemies. Plus, like many other The Greats, everything started going down the toilet after he checked out. His thirteenth son, Merneptah, followed in his footsteps to become pharaoh, but revolts, succession disputes, and invasions followed as well, and within 150 years, the new kingdom of Egypt not only wasn't new anymore, but it was no longer around. Give credit to Ramses the Great for keeping Egypt great and looking great doing it. Thanks for watching this canned history by The Canned Historian. 
Be sure to subscribe to my channel to see my latest videos that you anxiously wait by your computer all day for. Also, check out my blog for even more of my histories. I have composed annals on the Great Pyramids of Giza, as well as Akhenaten, for your reading pleasure, so give your ears a rest for once. As always, those who don't study the past are doomed. Doomed!